Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We are in our final few segments of our Championing Over Violence Summit. Today, we have a gentleman that I respect greatly in the short time that I've come to know him, Mr. Charlson Gaines. He is an emotional intelligence educator, a disabled Air Force veteran, and, he and health psychology PhD candidate. He holds a master's degree in health psychology, behavioral medicine, and project management. Charlson Gaines is a certified trauma professional, certified cognitive um, behavioral life coach, and he has worked for the Department of Defense as a master resilience trainer. He is also an international speaker who's spoken at 50 events to over 5,000 attendees including providing mental health education to the Chicago Teachers Union. He has six years of experience in the Air Force and Navy in terms of their sexual assault prevention and response. Headquartered offices managing the training programs for over 300,000 US military personnel. He has been studying psychology specifically around suicide and trauma for over 20 years, and has come to realize that emotional intelligence is the foundation of proactive prevention of suicide, as well as healing from trauma, guilt, shame, self-doubt, and low self-esteem. Charleston <laughs> Gaines is on a mission to empower you to replace misery with happiness and learn to love yourself again. He believes that we all deserve to be happy. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> With that, I give you the mic. I'm gonna spotlight you as well, all right? So that you're on the main screen. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for that intro. And I just, I'm really grateful that I can be here. Um, you know, I just, I love to serve people. I look at my life and I look at a lot of the experiences that I've had. And a lot of the experiences that I've had, the good things in my life, I did not earn those things, right? We're just kind of, we're born into families, we're born into circumstances. And so that's why gratitude is so important, right? Just being grateful for even where you were able to start this life. And so knowing the privileges that I've had, knowing the advantages that I've had, it makes me grateful for opportunities to serve other people. So I'm excited to be here most definitely. And today, what I really wanna focus on is getting people to understand you know, that they deserve to be happy. So I'm gonna say it plainly, you deserve to be happy. And so what I want everyone to do is to take a moment. You can be watching live. You can be watching a replay. I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say the words, I deserve to be happy. Now, not everyone says that aloud. You can say it to yourself. Some people can type it in the chat. Some people can write it down. But for some people, it's very difficult to say those words because they don't believe it. You need to understand that you deserve to be happy. You can't be afraid to say it. And I look at it like the way that we perceive other people. When you look at someone else, someone that you care about, you don't look at their merits. You don't look at their history. You look at who they are as a human being. And you wish happiness upon that person. But there's no reason for other people to, to deserve happiness and you don't. You deserve to be happy. So if it was hard for you the first time, we're going to try it again. Repeat after me. I deserve to be happy. When we're talking about happiness, understand that it is, it is something that takes practice. It's an action word. It takes effort. It takes action to elevate your happiness baseline. And I'm going to get into what happiness baseline means, but understand that it does take action. It takes work. 
You can't just walk around happy all the time. You need to be intentional with your happiness. Because some of you may think about happiness and you think to yourself, life is hard and I don't know how to do that. But when you recognize that you deserve to be happy, then you begin to recognize the work that is required. And what you need to understand is that you are worthy of the work. You are worthy of the effort. And so don't be afraid to put in the effort to intentionally elevate your happiness because you deserve it. And the truth is that everybody who knows you, who loves you, who cares about you also wants you to be happy, but they don't know how to make you happy. They don't know the things to say. They don't know the things to buy. A lot of them don't know about your past traumas. They don't know about your history. They don't know what you've endured. They just know that when they look at you, they want to see you smile. And when you look in the mirror, there's a part of you that also wants to see you smile. So that's why I'm telling you that you deserve to be happy and you are worthy of the effort. You need to put in the work. For so many people, though, when we talk about becoming happy, it's hard to even envision that because of the way that you perceive yourself. Some people look at their past trauma. They look at what they've endured, maybe what you're going through right now. And you have certain words to label yourself. You say, I'm a victim. These things happen to me. And even in the trauma that you've endured, you find ways to blame yourself. Yeah. But what needs to happen is you need to recognize. As well, for you, there's some messages that are being put in the chat. So you might want to look at that. Okay, I can definitely do that. Um, They're resonating with everything you're saying. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but, you know, what I'm, what I'm saying is that when you're looking at yourself as a victim, you label yourself and you kind of box yourself in. And you begin to fight. But a lot of people who have been victimized, who have been traumatized, are fighting for survival. And sometimes we're inspired by people who say, I've gone from victim to victor. I've gone from victim to survivor. So we look at those people and we're inspired by them. And it's good to be inspired. But understand that anyone who's gone from victim to survivor is someone who put an effort to elevate their life. And you deserve to put in the same effort because what you need to understand is that you are worth fighting for. And then when you dig deeper, you have to understand that you are the one who's going to be doing the fighting. Yes, we want people to fight for us. Yes, we want people to support us, to have our back, to tell us it's going to be OK. But when you feel it deep down inside that you deserve to be happy. Then you have this inherent motivation this fire burning inside you to elevate your life. And it's hard to do that if you don't already know that you deserve to be happy. And the reason for that is because it is hard, difficult to go against your beliefs. So if you believe you are no more than just a victim, then it's hard to take action to become a survivor and then to be happy. But what I want you to know is that you can use that fire, you can use that desire to not just go from victim to survivor, but go from a survivor to someone who is happy and thriving. Understand this, this was one of my favorite quotes and it's by Dr. Viktor Frankl. He said that, that which is to give light must endure burning. Dr. Viktor Frankl spent five years in Auschwitz. He was a Jew from Poland, and he was in a German concentration camp in World War II, and he survived. He was liberated, and then after he was liberated, he thought about, why am I here? Why did I survive? And the answer is because he had purpose. Your purpose has to start with who you are as a person. And what I mean by that is, it's hard to serve others when you have your own needs. So you have to take care of yourself first. Self-care is not selfish. And so what I really want to do as we truly begin to grasp that we all deserve to be happy is I want to get into the aspects of emotional intelligence and positive psychology that provides you the tools to elevate your happiness. Because here's the truth. I can tell you to just be happy. I can tell you to just love yourself. 
I can tell you that you deserve to be happy and you can believe me. But we need the tools. We need to know how to do it. And what I want to do is provide you some of those tools. And so the foundation of elevating your happiness is self-awareness. You know, but I'm going to step back for a second. I'm going to talk about the happiness baseline. Because when I talk about elevating your happiness, I'm talking about elevating your happiness baseline. And your happiness baseline is like your default setting. Imagine on a scale of zero to 10. Zero is where people are who are absolutely miserable. Maybe they are facing the threat of dying by suicide. That's how miserable they are. And people who are a 10 are as happy as they can possibly be. And so regardless of where you are on the scale, you deserve to elevate your happiness. You deserve to rise up the scale and be happier. And being happy is not an emotion. I'm not talking about feeling happy 100% of the time. I'm talking about being a happy person because even happy people feel sad. You get angry, you're fearful, it happens. Those are all important emotions. They all have a purpose. Our emotions are our way of communicating to ourselves the state of what is going on. And so maybe there's an imminent threat and you are fearful. That emotion serves a purpose. Maybe you need to hide. Maybe you need to get away. So it serves a purpose. But when the threat is gone and you return back to your default level of happiness, what are you? A two, a four, where are you on the happiness baseline? And so a lot of people will look at that and they will say, I'm a four, a five, or a two, and they don't know how to elevate that. They don't know how to be happier. And so what I want to do is I want to teach you some of those skills. The first thing I want to talk about is self-awareness. And self-awareness is the foundation of emotional intelligence really elevating your happiness. Now, I've said many times I've said so many times that self-awareness is knowing what you feel, why you feel that way, and how you experience and express those emotions. And that's not wrong. And as a matter of fact, what I want you to do right now is to come up with a single word to describe what you're feeling right now. For some people, for some people, that's a difficult task. They don't know what they're feeling. And that's okay. A recurring theme that I want to give you guys is don't judge yourself. It's simple as that. Don't judge yourself. Don't judge yourself because you honestly, you may not realize this, but you are perfect the way you are. You are in a situation. You're in this life that you created for yourself. So you are who you are supposed to be. So don't judge yourself. Don't think about if you had done something differently, if you had not made this mistake, if you hadn't failed at this. We're not going to use what if made up scenarios to judge ourselves. We're not going to look back at past events and try to apply the knowledge we have today to what we should have done in those past events. We're not going to judge ourselves. What we're going to do is accept ourselves for who we are and then choose to elevate. And so when I'm talking about self-awareness and the elevation is not only what you feel, why you feel that way, and how you experience and express those emotions. It's also, what do you wish to feel? What emotions do you want to experience more often? What do you want to be the source of those emotions? And what's it going to look like when you get there? What, what I really want you to do, what I want people to do more often is I want them to visualize that life. You see, what we often do is we talk about, I want to be my best self. I want to elevate. I want to be better. I want to be great. So many of us have had those thoughts and continue to have those thoughts. But what does that look like? What does your best self look like? What are the characteristics of your best self? Is your best self more empathetic? a better listener? Is your best self someone who's a better communicator? Someone who's able to express emotion better? You see, a lot of times when we think about being our best self, 
we think about we think about it in terms of some abstract point in time in the future, but in reality, you can choose to improve right now. You can choose to be more empathetic because empathy is a skill that you develop, that you work on. You can choose to have more integrity. You can choose to be a better communicator and a better listener. So as you begin to evolve into these attributes right now, then you are preparing yourself for the life that you're choosing to build for yourself and understand that you have the power to build that life. But you're not even going to begin without self-awareness, without recognizing who you are right now, who you choose to be and what that's going to look like, which is why I'm an advocate for visualizing your best life so that you know what that looks like. And then you can build that roadmap. You can figure out how to get there. A lot of times as we're building that roadmap, we begin to make excuses of why we're not going to get there. We have this self-judgment and we have to get away from that. And when I'm talking about self-judgment, there are certain things that we do, certain tools that we will use to bring ourselves down. And I want to dig into that a little bit. The first tool is biases. We all have them. And I want to bring them to the forefront because I want you to recognize if and when you do this to yourself. So there's a couple of them that I want to cover for you to recognize. And the first one I want to talk about is confirmation bias. It's so important. We talk about, we talk about confirmation bias when it comes to global events. When we, when we look at what's happening on social media, we say that you have this opinion about this topic, and then you go do research, Google searches, to find information to confirm your opinion about that topic. But we also use confirmation bias to hold ourselves down. For example, if you believe yourself to have below average intelligence, every time you make a mistake, you will use that to confirm to yourself that you are not as smart as you could be or should be. If you believe that you're unorganized, every time that you're looking for something and can't find it, you will use that information to confirm your bias about yourself that you're unorganized. And if you are hurting from trauma, if you've been traumatized, if you've been victimized and you are dealing, you are dealing with that daily and you have it stuck in your head that this is the life that is meant for you, that this is your fate, that you are destined to suffer. You will use confirmation bias to confirm to yourself that you don't deserve a better life. When in reality, take that bias off, try to look at your life from a bigger picture, and again, recognize that you deserve to be happy. Confirmation bias is a tool that we use continually to judge ourselves. And I want you to recognize when you're doing that, because by recognizing you're doing that, you empower yourself to stop doing that. You empower yourself to control your thoughts and emotions. You empower yourself to elevate yourself, your life, your happiness baseline. Self-awareness enables you to see where you're at and recognize how it does or does not align with where you're trying to go. And so that is what makes self-awareness the foundation of elevating your happiness. Another bias that I want to talk about is negativity bias. When I think of negativity bias, I think of that old old adage or saying or whatever you want to call it, where people say, are you the kind of person who looks at a cup as half full or half empty? And we say that there are positive people who look at the cup as half full, and there are negative people who look at the cup as half empty. And a lot of people who may be negative have this negativity of bi- a negativity bias that they apply to various situations in their lives. And what that gets you to do is it gets you to look for the negative. It gets you to look for what is wrong. For example, when someone offers you a compliment, it's hard for you to just accept that. It's hard for you to accept encouragement, for you to accept positivity, for you to accept just the love and concern of others. If you have a negativity bias, you think, what do they want? They must want something. Or if you're judging yourself, you think you're only complimenting me because you don't see the real me. 
And so you're using those biases to judge yourself. But I want to tell you this. I don't ever look at the cup as if it's half full or half empty. I choose gratitude. And I'm grateful just to have a cup in the first place. The next thing I want to talk about when it comes to self-awareness is the primary emotions. Now, when I'm working with different people and organizations, I tell, I tell them that there are four primary emotions. I've seen models with five or six, but I go with four. And those four primary emotions are happiness, sadness, fear, and anger. So one thing about self-awareness is really recognizing your patterns, recognizing your habits. And so what I want you to do is take a few moments to think about the last seven days. Over the last seven days, which of those four emotions have you felt most often? Happiness, sadness, fear, or anger? So again, I'm going to talk about the self-judgment. Because what I want you to do is I want you to look at what you felt. And I want you to recognize that there's nothing wrong with that. If you were angry more often in the last seven days, then maybe you feel you should have been. You don't judge yourself. Anger is a natural emotion. And there are things that happen in life that should make you angry. If someone betrays you, maybe you should be angry about it. So you don't judge yourself about the emotions that you've experienced. What you do is you put effort into aligning your emotions with the life that you're trying to build. So if you want to build, if you want to feel happiness more often in the last, you know, in the next seven days, if you want to feel happiness more often, then figure out how to do that. And there's actual techniques for that that I'm going to get into later. But what I really want you to do is understand the emotions that you felt most often in the last seven days so that you can begin to recognize where you're at. And is that congruent with the number that you gave yourself on the happiness baseline? And you see, as you develop and elevate your self-awareness, you more and more empower yourself to elevate your happiness. And so the way that you do that, the foundational way to do that is to manage your emotions. So I'm going to talk about self-regulation now because self-awareness is understanding what you feel why you feel that way, and how you express and experience those emotions. It's also what emotions you want to feel and what you want to be the cause for those emotions. And self-regulation begins with emotion regulation. It is the power to influence what you feel, why you feel that way, and how you express and experience those emotions. And so that definition is from, is from Dr. James Gross, was currently professor of psychology at Stanford University. And I always go with that definition because I need you to understand that that's exactly what we're talking about, influencing your emotions. We've heard plenty of times to control your emotions, don't let your emotions control you. Controlling your emotions is not suppressing or denying your emotions. Research has shown that people who suppress the emotions that they feel are bad, like sadness or anger or fear, those people have a hard time feeling joy. They have a hard time feeling the positive emotions because either you're suppressing all of your emotional expression or you're not. So suppressing emotion is not healthy and that is not controlling your emotion. And denying your emotions is also not healthy. We want to acknowledge our emotions because you have to truly feel your emotions to heal from your emotions. And all of your emotions are valid. There are not good emotions and bad emotions. There are not fake emotions and real emotions. All emotions are valid. And when I say control your emotions, I'm talking about having that influence because we're not just going to turn certain emotions off. If you are grieving the loss of someone you love, you're not going to turn that off. The grief has to work. It has to do its work. And then as the grief begins to subside, what happens is there are moments during that process where you are better able to choose your emotion, where you're better able to put effort into being grateful. And I'll give you an example of that is when you lose someone very close to you and the first two or three days you are bawling, you're crying your eyes out. Well, that's good, isn't it? 
that you had such a love for this person that you are so wounded by losing them. It is a privilege to love so hard and so true. So we don't want to turn that off, but then there are days where it begins to subside, where there are fewer tears. And in those moments, you can choose to honor that person. You can choose to remember the good times. You can choose to go back and look at the old photos, go back and look at the old videos. You can think about what had meaning or value to that person, how you can incorporate that into your life. And so you see how you are influencing your emotions by doing that. For some people, of course, it's harder than others. And so there are specific techniques that you might want to apply to help you regulate your emotions better. I'm gonna tell you about two of them that I employ and that I teach others to employ. And the first one I wanna talk about is gratitude. Here's a simple fact, and of course, you can test me on this if you want. You cannot be grateful and angry at the same time. You can't do it because there's different energies, there's different vibrations within you when you're expressing gratitude. When you're happy for the life that you have and the opportunities that have been provided for you, then you can't be angry. Now, understand, I'm not saying to deny what happened to you. Some of us have been through some horrible experiences. We're not going to forget those things happened. What I'm talking about is in the micro moments, when you have time to reflect on your life, choose gratitude. Choose it. Choose gratitude. And what I mean by that is influencing your emotions by recognizing that you have opportunities to excel. You have opportunities to improve different areas of your life. And I want you to take advantage of those opportunities, but you won't do that if you take those opportunities for granted. And taking it for granted, honestly, is very easy to do if you're used to misery. And so what I'm telling you is that the process, the road, the path to go from misery to happiness is longer for some people than it is for others. It is a journey. It's a process. I'm not going to tell you to practice gratitude two days in a row and all of a sudden your happiness baseline has gone from a two to a seven. Because the truth is happiness doesn't have an end state. You don't arrive at happy and celebrate that you've arrived. What you do is you're grateful for the happy moments and you put in effort every day to live a happy life, a life where you can be grateful for what's around you. And when you practice gratitude, the reason why it enables you and empowers you to manage your emotions is because what's really going on is there's no threat in gratitude. There's no part of gratitude that's going to harm you. And so when you recognize that there's no threat, your brain turns off the stress response. Understand that when you're in fight or flight mode, your body produces chemicals such as cortisol and adrenaline. And it makes sense because when you think about it, if you are attempting to escape from a dangerous situation, your heart's going to beat faster. Your breathing is going to become shallower so that you can get blood and oxygen to the muscles that are needed to escape. The fight or flight principle, the stress response has its purpose. But when you're miserable, you keep it turned on, kind of a low-grade version of it, continuously. So, for example, if you're sitting there thinking about the bad days, your brain doesn't know if there's an imminent threat or not. So you have this state where you're just staying ready, or you have low doses of adrenaline and cortisol running through your body and has nowhere to go. So your body is out of balance. Practicing gratitude turns off that stress response and turns on the relaxed response. So you stop producing the adrenaline and the cortisol in excessive amounts. You begin producing more serotonin and dopamine. So practicing gratitude not just makes you feel better now, but it prepares your mind and body to elevate your happiness daily. And another thing that you can do is mindfulness meditation. And I love talking about this. Because it's using your breath, using your body to inform your brain that there's no threat. And when I talk about your breath, understand that when you were born, the first thing, the first thing that you needed to accomplish in your life was to take a breath 
That's how you came alive. It's simple as that. The first goal you ever had was to breathe. And you don't remember it because breathing is a natural part of what we do. You don't have to think about it. But what happens when you get really stressed is that your breathing picks up and it gets shallower and your brain cannot tell that there's no threat. So what you'll do is you practice the meditation and using your slow, calming breaths to inform your brain there's not a threat. So your brain wants to send some adrenaline and cortisol through your body and your body responds with saying, no, thank you. We don't need that right now. I've chosen to breathe deeply. I've chosen to mindfully be present in this moment where I can be grateful for my opportunities, grateful for my life, and I'm not running, I'm not stressed, I'm not afraid. People who live with trauma and who experience trauma often blame themselves, and they often don't know when to feel safe. And there's actually times where you can also be in a safe environment but your body is not used to that. And so then you have to be intentional about telling your brain that you're safe. And when I tell you this, what I'm saying is that your fight or flight principle, your stress response is it's initiated from what's what some people call the reptilian brain, right? It's, it's the limbic system starts in the amygdala where it takes these it takes these stimuli and it says, hey, there's a threat. And in that part of your brain, there's no ability to keep time. So your stress response does not know that the trauma happened yesterday or 20 years ago. It doesn't know. So if there's something that happens that triggers that response, your stress response, your fight or flight doesn't know that the initial trauma was 20 years ago. That's why you use your breath to tell your brain there's not a, a threat because you turn off your stress response, you turn on your relaxed response, which, is, which includes the thinking centers of your brain, and that's where time is kept. That is where you have the ability to look around and assess your environment and recognize that there's no threat. And so then your body tells your brain, let's relax, let's calm down. Let's be mindful. Let's be present. Let's center ourselves with our current environment. And when you do that, then you empower yourself to begin to really take action to elevate your happiness. You see, when you're miserable, you can't really do things that bring you happiness when you're, when you're stuck in that misery. And that's why the self-awareness and the self-regulation are so important because you have to empower yourself to get out of that state so that you are open and available to replacing misery with happiness. You can't just go through the motions. You have to bring all of you. You have to bring your breath. You have to bring your senses. You have to bring your thoughts. You have to bring your spirit, your energy, your vision. You have to bring all of you into this effort, this journey to elevate your happiness. So you can't half do it. And you can't blame other people and you can't blame yourself. What you have to do is you have to say, that's the past. I'm grateful that I survived, but I'm done being a survivor. You see, the thing is, when we are fighting, when there's something to fight for, we often choose to fight. And I say all the time, if you have to fight, fight to win. But a lot of people don't know what it means to win. They don't know what winning looks like. And the reason you don't know what winning looks like is because you have not decided for yourself what winning looks like. We look for external sources, external information, but look deep within. What does it feel like when I've won, when I'm free, when I can stop crying, when I can breathe deep, when I can be mindful and present and enjoy the moment? And when you get to that state. Now you're in a position, this is the exciting part. Now you're in a position to do what it takes to elevate your happiness. And I'm excited to tell you about this. This concept is taken from positive psychology. Positive psychology was developed by Dr. Martin Seligman. And he took a combination of a lot of different aspects of psychology and put them together to form what's called the theory of sustained well-being. And the reason for this is because 
a lot of people will do things and expect to be happy instead of going out and getting the happiness. You can't sit around and wait for happiness to come find you. You can't sit around and hope to be happy. You have to take action. And if you don't believe you deserve to be happy, you can say it again right now. You can say, I deserve to be happy because it is just as true now as it was when I first began speaking, as it was yesterday, and as it's true tomorrow and in the future that you deserve to be happy. And so how do you elevate your happiness? There's this idea, this concept called PERMA. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you about PERMA and I'm gonna simplify it for you because as I'm describing PERMA to you, what you're gonna recognize is that everything I tell you to some degree, you already knew. I'm not gonna tell you anything mind blowing. I'm not gonna tell you anything revolutionary because the revolution is in you choosing to be happy. You see the actions themselves are not revolutionary. The revolution is in you loving yourself. The revolution is in you deciding that you're gonna stop fighting to survive and you're gonna fight to live your best life. You're gonna fight to be your best you. That's the revolution. You are the revolution in your life. And so then the way that you do that, the way that you do that is through PERMA. And PERMA, is P-E-R-M-A, and each of these elements are things that you seek by themselves, regardless of the other elements. And so the, the P is positive emotion, the E is for engaging, the R is for relationships, M is for meaning, and A is for achievement. So let's, let's just jump right in. The P is for positive emotion. Simply put, cultivate positive emotions. Do things that make you feel happier more often. The more often that you cultivate positive emotions in your life, the more you elevate your happiness baseline. When I say that to you, that's not surprising. Part of you says, oh, that's common sense. It's obvious. But the piece that you're missing is that you need to do that for yourself. You see, it's not just having the information. It's the taking action that's the revolution. Recognizing the change needs to be made is not the revolution. And when I'm talking about a revolution, I'm not talking about something systemic or global. I'm talking about the revolution within you, not the evolution, not the evolving over 20 or 30 years. I'm talking about you choosing to be happy now. And what you can begin to do now is to cultivate positive emotions in your life. How do you do that? What are the positive emotions? I spoke about gratitude. Practice gratitude. What are three things that you're grateful for? What are three things that happened in the last 24 hours that are good for you? What happened to you? Who's in your life? Practice gratitude. Another idea that I use also is setting joy triggers. For example, if you have a happy memory about a certain place, every time you pass by that place, maybe you're driving, you pass by that place, take a moment to reminisce about the happy memory. Anytime you enter a certain room or enter a certain doorway, choose a positive thought or a positive memory. Joy triggers so that you are putting intentional effort into joy. Some people don't do that because they haven't thought about it. But now that I've told it to you, you have no excuse. I challenge you to do that. And the challenge is for people who don't believe they deserve to be happy, but I've told you that you deserve to be happy and you've even said it to yourself. So now that we've overcome that barrier, set the joy triggers, practice gratitude. The E in PERMA is for engagement. And the concept is engaging your strengths, but it's really about what you love, what makes you come alive. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a couple moments to think about an activity that you do that you love so much, you become completely engrossed in that activity. You lose track of time, you lose track of the amount of energy you spent, and really you come alive. And it could be anything. Think about it. Maybe it's playing basketball. Maybe it's laughing. Maybe it's painting, working out, playing music, horseback riding, going to botanical gardens. It could be looking at videos of kittens. It doesn't matter what it is. You know what makes you come alive. And for some of you that haven't thought about it in a while, put a little extra effort or energy into thinking about it because 
your happiness is worth the extra effort and energy. I want you to be intentional about your happiness. You have to choose happiness. You can't wait for it. You have to choose happiness. And so what I want you to do is find that thing that makes you come alive and do it more often. Now, like I said before, this isn't mind-blowing stuff. So check this out. The more often you do what you love, the happier you will be. If you don't believe me, test me. Go do what you love and see how you feel. The R in PERMA is for relationships. Enhance your relationships. We are social beings. We love love. We love best friends. That's what we have nicknames for. Bestie, BFF, best friends forever. My play cousin. We have people in our lives where we feel like the word friend isn't strong enough. Enhance those relationships. Put effort, put effort into making the relationship better. And one way that you can do that is by practicing gratitude with that person. For example, in the little conversations you have, when you see someone that you care about on Monday, don't say, how was your weekend? They're like, ah, I was okay. Ask them what good happened this weekend. If you know they had plans, ask them about those plans. You were going to the art museum. Did you enjoy it? Or maybe there's something that they do every weekend that they don't like, and then they had the weekend off. How did you, what did you do to enjoy your weekend? Or if they had to work all weekend, or if they struggled all weekend, ask them, did you do anything that you were proud of? Did you accomplish anything that you liked? And when you do that, you cause them to put effort into thinking of something positive. So you're enhancing the relationship by putting effort into sharing the cultivation of positive emotions. Put more effort into enhancing relationships and you will be happier. You will elevate your happiness baseline. The M in PERMA is for meaning. Do things that have meaning to you. Do things that have value. What are your values? When I talk about meaning, what I like to inform you know, clients and organizations and other people that I speak to is that you have to align your values with your thoughts and your actions. And so as you go about your day, look at what you're doing and see how that aligns with your values. And if it aligns with your values, then be proud of that. And that goes back to cultivating positive emotion, right? You see, there are so many opportunities to cultivate positive emotions. But look, look at the things that you think about a certain situation and then think about your values. For example, if you are very angry and want to harm somebody, but your value is peace, there's a misalignment. So then align your thoughts and your values. And then when your thoughts and values are aligned, it's going to show itself in your behavior. And so the more often you do that, the more you're able to just acknowledge your wins. Integrity is my value. And today I practice integrity throughout the entire day. Now I have to go back to a concept we talked about earlier. Don't judge yourself because nobody's perfect. So in a day where your thoughts and behaviors do not align with your values, don't judge yourself. You learn you forgive yourself, you accept yourself, because all that you've really done was confirm that you're human. Your imperfections confirm that you're a human being. That's all it does. It's just information. Don't take advantage. Don't use that as an opportunity to judge yourself. Don't apply the confirmation bias to put more labels on yourself. Acknowledge what happened. Hold yourself accountable. How can I be better tomorrow? How can I make up for this? Do I need to apologize? Hold yourself accountable, but don't judge yourself. You're a person who made a mistake, which is different than a person who is a mistake. Don't judge yourself, hold yourself accountable, and then go back to the habit, the process, the practice of aligning your values, thoughts, and actions. And when you do that consistently, what are you doing? You are, you are applying your energy and your effort to meaning to that which has meaning to you, which is the M in PERMA. And so again, the P is positive emotion. The E is engaging your strengths. The R is relationships to enhance your relationships. And the M is meaning. And the A is achievement. 
Now, there's two different layers to A being achievement. The first layer is you have to do things where you actually achieve something. Go do something. What has meaning to you? What has value? What do you want to do with your life? Go do it. Go achieve something. But I say there's two layers to it because some people don't believe in themselves and they need to elevate that self-confidence. And the way that you elevate your self-confidence, honestly, is through taking action. It's simple as that. You take action, go accomplish something. The more that you accomplish, the more that you elevate your confidence, which is cultivating positive emotions, and the more that you elevate your happiness baseline. But the other layer to that is people who are consistently achieving things but don't give themselves credit. You have to acknowledge your wins. You worked hard, you put in effort. And if it was easy for you to accomplish that thing, it's because you have a lifetime of building that skill because whatever that skill is, whatever that topic, that event, that activity is, is important to you. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you how to apply PERMA in its simplest form. Because I already know that I didn't tell you anything mind-blowing. I did not blow you away. What really has to happen is you have to align PERMA with who you are and your desire to achieve the happiness that you deserve, that we've already proclaimed that you deserve because you deserve to be happy. So here's, here's PERMA in its simplest form. Do what you love with people you love something that has meaning to you where you feel a sense of accomplishment. Simple as that. And when you do that, the positive emotions are inevitable and you elevate your happiness baseline. And it doesn't matter how fancy it is. You don't have to make it fancy. It doesn't have to be grandiose. I'm not talking about winning races unless that's what you want to do. I'm not talking about painting masterpieces unless that's what you want to do. But maybe you just love to paint. What I'm talking about is having gratitude in the micro moments. For example, when I say do something I love with someone I love that has meaning to me, where I feel a sense of achievement, I'm talking about driving my kids to school. Simple as that. Education, intelligence, that's a value of mine. I love my family. It's an achievement as they continue to progress. So you see, you don't have to overcomplicate it. You don't have to overthink it. You don't have to come up with some fancy definition. You just have to do it. And the reason you're going to do it is because you deserve to be happy. It's simple as that. In this life, everybody that you know, you want them to get what they deserve. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. You don't want people to be in pain who don't deserve to be in pain. You don't want people to be miserable, who deserve happiness and joy. You want people to get what they deserve. But I'm telling you that you deserve to be happy and I want you to get what you deserve. But I can't do it for you. You have to choose happiness for yourself. You have to understand that it's a process. It takes work. It takes effort, but you're worth the work. You are worth the effort. And everybody that you know and love wants you to be happy. Everybody can't provide you with resources. Everybody can't keep you safe from danger. So I'm not talking about something delusional, right? You can't always just change your circumstances immediately. You can't change your environment right now. But where you are right now, you can choose to be present. And you can take advantage of the, take advantage of the opportunity to practice gratitude and to spend time with people that you love and intentionally elevate your happiness baseline. Because again, you deserve to be happy. You don't judge yourself. You don't insult yourself. What you do is you look at who you are as a person and you accept who you are as a person because you are the perfect you for your environment right now. And as you elevate your happiness, you're also going to elevate your environment. The two go together. It's inevitable. You cannot separate it because you have such a great impact on your environment. And so what I want you to do when you're in a position of judging yourself is I want you to acknowledge and recognize that you're doing that. And I want you to choose to stop. And you can't just say to yourself, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. What you have to do is you have to replace the judgment. You have to replace the negativity with positivity. And so when you're judging yourself, you could say something like, 
I'm not very intelligent, which of course is not true. But if you were to say that to yourself, dispute that belief about yourself. I'm not very intelligent. However, I did excel in this. I am good at this. Maybe this subject in school was hard for me, but I'm really good at this, this hobby, this habit, whether it's playing sports, whether it's art, whether it's playing music, there are things that you're good at and you got that way because you had the intelligence you have the ability to master it. So when you choose to reframe your thinking, again, you're influencing your emotions and you are empowering yourself to elevate your happiness baseline. And again, the reason you want to do that is because you deserve to be happy. And so what I want to do, I just want to close with, with a redundancy. I just want to say it again. Repeat after me, I deserve to be happy. And so with that, I'm grateful that I had this opportunity to serve you. I hope that you feel loved and served. I hope that you love yourself and begin to serve yourself what you deserve. And if anyone has any questions or comments for me, you can, you know, just let me know. I'm going to go through the um, chat messages. And then if anyone wants to unmute themselves and just ask me directly, we can do that as well. Again, thank you very much. That was excellent, Charleston. Thank you. Excellent, just excellent. Such great value. There were several people that came in and out um, on Clubhouse listening in and Lori's on the stage. She'll be coming into the room very soon. And we had very, very active in the chat. I, <laughs> I nicknamed him X, <laughs> like Malcolm X, because he is that deep. Um, so it's exclusive, it looks like, International, who is with us here in the house. And he has very generously given you a lot of feedback. He, he was just resonating with so much of what you were saying. I, I, I love it. I, I love it so much. And what, what I want, you know, and I know he's still in the room. And so what I want you to understand Exclusive International is by you choosing to engage, you're setting an example for everyone else. So many people see discussions and events about happiness and they're afraid to engage. They're afraid to step up. But what you did is an example for others. You're like, this, is, this has to do with happiness. I'm going to get in the game. That's what more people need to do. They need to get in the game. I appreciate you. I'm grateful that you're here. Yeah, I get a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, um... You said, so do I, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And now Lori is here and also on Facebook and uh, welcome into the room. Abdel Hakim, feel free to back channel us if you're, you have any questions for Charleston. He just delivered a powerful talk. You can be happy. And so he shared with us PERMA, so I wrote down in my notes about PERMA and I'm just going to repeat that for us. PERMA, positive emotions, engagement of your strengths, relationships, meaning and achievement. So that's what PERMA stands for. So I hope that helps you. And welcome in uh, Anatu Ben Lawal from originally from Ghana, and she'll be up next along with Lori. And so, Charleston, does anybody have any questions for Charleston, please? Feel free to unmic and ask. This is your time. Okay, they're quite shy. So I have a question for you. Yes. All right. So, and this is a question that I've been asking people where I'm really fascinated with their journey. And my curiosity comes to how did they embark on that journey? You know, here you are, you're really like specializing and this is like your niche, emotional intelligence. What 
made you hone in on this as your specialization? You know, it's, it's, so it's, it's a long journey, right? From things that I experienced or witnessed as, as a child and as a teen through my 20 years in the military. And, you know, one thing that happens with me, and I, I'm sure there are literally billions of people who can relate to this. When I think of the people in my life that are no longer here because of suicide, I always leave off a couple names because there's so many of them. And, um, and I'm actually retired. I retired from the military in 2014. And one thing with me in the military, and this isn't for everybody, but for me, it was like towards the end of my career, I, I realized that I was, I was a part of bringing violence and misery. And I wasn't happy with that. I wasn't, I was like, this, this is not who I am. Yeah, it, it's who I was when I was 19 years old, right? But we all evolve. And I was like, I don't wanna be a part of this anymore. And so, and I've been studying psychology for a while. And I said, you know what? I want to get more into the healing aspect of it. And so, you know, I had a couple of different jobs. And then I got into this one position where I was looking at managing two different programs. And one of them is the resilience program, which is one aspect of positive psychology. And when you only take one aspect of it, you're really missing a lot, right? So resilience is one aspect of positive psychology. And then there's also the suicide prevention part of it. And I just, so when we talked about resilience, we talked about like cognitive reappraisal and mindfulness and gratitude. And I just felt like, okay, that helps you be more resilient, but how does that prevent suicide? There's a gap. There's a gap between resilience and suicide. What is that gap? And I found the answer is emotional intelligence. The answer is, again, knowing who you are, what you're about, understanding your emotions, accepting yourself, understanding how to regulate your emotions, not judging yourself. All of these things are a foundation, right? You can't practice gratitude or you can, but it's very difficult to practice gratitude when you are spend most of your day struggling with PTSD or struggling with major depressive disorder or when you're just miserable, right? So when I say practice gratitude, the people who are experiencing the most misery are insulted by that. And so you can't just repeat that. Be happy, be happy, be happy. People don't want to hear that. But I can't elevate them out of that. They have to elevate themselves. And the foundation of that elevation is emotional intelligence. Ah, okay. Okay. So you're pointing them to the, to the ladder. Here it is. <laughs> These are the rungs. <laughs> Take the steps. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. I love that. I love that. And, and that was some positive motivation, right? Lived experience, right? And, and pain. You can only lead a horse to water. Ah, exclusive. Come yes. again. You could only lead a horse to water. You cannot make a drink. One yes. yes. He said you could only lead a horse to water. You cannot make a drink. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But imagine the horse doesn't recognize it's thirsty. I've, I've noticed that time and time again. So. Exactly, exactly. And that's where the self-awareness comes in. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what you need, but if you don't want to hear it, then maybe I should stop talking and practice empathy. Maybe I should just sit in the moment with you instead of trying to make you do anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, in it's terms of, uh, I'm sorry to cut you. In, in terms of being an empath, right? Do you have any advice as to how me as a healer or me as a, um, as, a, as a spiritual guide or a spiritual journey coach, how, how would I be able to approach society in a better way? You know, again, it goes with, with the self-awareness and the self-regulation because, you know, emotions are physiological. Mm -hmm. They're not just in your head, right? And the proof of that, the simplest proof that emotions are physiological is that when you're happiest and when you're saddest, those are tears running down your face. They're, they're not emotions, they're tears. It's physiological. And so as a certain emotion is building, you feel it in your body, right? 
And so you have to pay attention to your body. You have to recognize, okay, I'm feeling this now. And usually when I feel this in my chest or in my gut, I am a couple hours away from being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So it is in that moment where you can decide, okay, what works for me to prevent this? Maybe I need to redirect my energy. Maybe I should take a few minutes to do some mindfulness meditation, something like that. Maybe you want to, you know, stretch. And so not just the mindfulness meditation, but bringing the whole body into it, right? Which is why um, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which I suggest you definitely read, um, he says that when you've experienced trauma, you should practice yoga before psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so as you, as you begin to understand and feel what's happening in your body, then you're able to influence and manage that before you get to a point where you're overwhelmed. Um, because, because I've been there. I'm the, I'm the kind of guy, if we're in the same room and you're distraught, I'm going to feel it too. I was talking to someone yesterday and she was not feeling good about being so mad. And I told her, I said, I'm mad with you. I'm mad too, because I share in your emotion with you. Mm -hmm. But I recognize what that feels like in my body so that I keep it from overwhelming me. It's all frequency. It's all frequency and energy. But that's what a lot of people tend to overlook most of the time. I hear a lot of people talking about frequencies and energies and vibrations, and I don't fully understand that. Right. But at the same time, if that's how you work and that works for you, you have to embrace that. Right. You, you can't compare yourself to other people. You can't sit up there and judge yourself. This is what works for you as an empath who's working in vibrations and energies, and that enables you to help other people heal then you have to go all in on that. You have to be true to you, which aligns with your value of integrity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very true. Mm. I would love to chime in. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me. This is Lori. I can hear you, yes. Perfect. Um, hi, uh, Charleston. That's your name, correct? I see it at the bottom. Yes. I love everything that you're saying. I really just want to pour into you and say that as a survivor, everything you're saying uh, resonates with me um, as far as introspection and uh, self-awareness. And, you know, that kind of, it, it makes sense why you would meditate before therapy, because you really want to have your mind open to receive uh, before you just go into therapy. Because I think by nature, most people are resistant to change. And um, so, you know, by quieting the mind, quieting the white, the white noise, I think you're able to bring to the forefront um, your unconscious thoughts and things that you've kind of buried. And then um, also open yourself up to starting to take the next step. So um, I also studied psychology as well. So all of this stuff is super interesting to me anyway. But um, as a survivor, I, I really put... Um, the information that I have learned professionally into my personal life as well and, and into the work that I am trying to do with others. So I really appreciate and I would love to connect with you um, off of this site to somehow uh, maybe work on something together where you could be a guest speaker or something and, and help more people. I, I would love that. Um, two things I'll tell you, um, you can just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. And also, you can just email me directly. My email address is info at charlesongains.com. And really, anyone who's watching this or hears this can email me a question directly. Uh, um, I, I kind of pride myself on being available. Like, I, I like that. <laughs> yes, and so I would love to do that. Again, I've, I've experienced a lot of great things in my life where I feel joy in helping others. And so if I can speak to more audiences and help empower more people, I'd be grateful for the opportunity. And can I ask, um, are you a therapist as well? I am not. I'm um, so I'm I'm a life coach, um, and I focus on emotional intelligence. But at the same time, I'm a certified trauma professional, um, master resilience trainer, and my PhD is health psychology. So it's more research based and theoretical, um, and and it's. It's funny you ask me that because I'll tell you the truth. I'm not <laughs> like I know me, right? Self-awareness. 
I have a hard time dealing with other people's hard emotions regularly because I know that I'm a very emotional guy. I feel what you feel. Yeah, I, I totally resonate with that as well. I actually um, initially wanted to go into child psychology because I really wanted to advocate for children. And I find it difficult because, um, you know, as a survivor, it's a trigger as well um, to hear the stories of others and um, especially children, you know, you want to rescue them all and <laughs> run and save them all. And just uh, as a mother too, it's hard for me, but um I think that it would, I know at, le at least at this time, maybe in the future it might change, but I think it would be hard um, right now to not uh, take those stories home. And uh, really, I don't want that to stunt me from reaching other people. And I just love the fact that you're open to other ways because I, I feel like the way that we can reach more people is Eastern and Western ways because not every way resonates with every person. And I think tapping into emotional awareness and awareness in general of self um, means that those ways are going to differ uh, by culture, by gender, uh, by person. Yeah, definitely. And, and I'll tell you this. I'll tell you a story. Um, I was this was, I think, 2012. And I was in Colorado Springs and this guest speaker came down. It was like an all day seminar. And there's this guest speaker. Her name was Marguerite. And she came down from the Denver School of Professional Psychology. She was speaking on trauma, PTSD. And afterward, we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation and I asked her about what does she use or what's her primary method of helping you know, veterans with PTSD? And her response was, whatever they want. So she, she does her psychotherapy, but there's also yoga and the energy healing. And some of them maybe want to smoke weed. Some of them want to do equine therapy. Some of them want therapy dogs. And she said that when people are really hurting, they just want to feel better. And so when I think about providing help, providing therapy, providing services or coaching for someone, and maybe I think that, say, cognitive behavioral psych, you know, therapy is better than all the rest, right? Maybe that's, that's my perspective. And, and I first heard this quote from um, Esther Perel. But what she said was, you can be right or you can be effective. And so if I'm choosing to be effective, I'm not going to hold on to this idea that my way is the right way. Because if I want you to heal, then I've got to work with you. Um, and that's actually what was said by um, the previous speaker. Her name was Elaine. I want to say Elaine Amal. I'm not sure her last name. But she even said the same thing. And working with people who have suffered trauma, we can't just work for them. We have to work with them. I mean, in that case, uh, let me go ahead with it. If, if that is the case, once again, I, I know you said that, you know, you can only help the people that want to be helped. But um, there's a lot of people that we do work with as well on, on my side, and they don't, I don't think most of society is even open to working with people anymore. It's like they're right and they're always right and there's no wrong. So. Yeah, there's, there's lots of barriers to getting help. And that's, that goes back to why I focus on emotional intelligence, because the truth is a lot of people have some people don't realize it yet. And some people have really embodied this, but the truth is nobody's coming to save you. People are going to want to help you, but you got to save yourself. That's where the emotional intelligence comes in. What do I need the most right now? What do I need the most long-term? You can be suffering from trauma, PTSD, all of this other stuff. Maybe right now, what you need is a safe place to sleep. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that self-awareness. And you have to be able to recognize what you need and how to get it. And you also have to recognize when someone's energy or purpose doesn't align with yours. You might need therapy and you might meet with a therapist. But if you guys don't vibe, there's no point. Mm -hmm. it's, it's conflicting energies. And so self-awareness enables you to recognize that and make informed decisions about yourself. As opposed to, as opposed to denying yourself, because we'll do that. We will deny ourselves. We'll say this doesn't feel right, but so and so said I should do it, so I'm going to do it. 
And then later on, you realize you should have went with your gut. Self-awareness enables you to recognize early, this isn't going to work for me. You know, I really have to say, I completely agree with what you just said. And it just brought back a memory. Something I just recently had to do was to disconnect from my therapist because she, though she claimed verbally to be supportive, I wasn't seeing that translated into action. And so many times people who work in the field of psychology, um, they're, they're not apt to self-evaluate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're yeah. very good at telling others what to do. But when I see the, and I, I love that exclusive had put it in the chat, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> um, honestly, I want to put it like this. There's a lot of fraudulent activity nowadays, especially within the spiritual community. It's, I don't know, I, I don't know how to feel about it, honestly, because I've done so much work within the years through extensive amounts of research. And um, people sit here telling me that I'm, I'm, you know, not credible and stuff like that. So, but. Well, well I'll, I'll say this, though. When, when you talk about therapists, maybe who, maybe they're, they're not effective or whatever. Here's what we have to recognize. And, and so to me, emotional intelligence enables you to apply empathy to these situations. Among people who are therapists, among people who are doctors and counselors or whatever helping profession, within that group, there's also a population of people who are dealing with their own trauma, their own insecurity, their own hurts. And so maybe they're trying to provide therapy to you but they don't have the self-awareness to recognize that they're not capable because of what they're dealing with. They have the skill set, but what you're struggling with happened to me two weeks ago and I'm not ready yet. And so again, back to emotional intelligence and it enables you actually to apply more ethics to what you're doing, to be able to say, I'm not the right fit for you at this time. And so a lot of times when we see people that are aggressive or mean or fraudulent or whatever, there's a reason why. And for a lot of those people, it's feeling incompetent, feeling insecure. They just want to belong, Mm -hmm. you know, and and for example, I'll tell you about this, this whole career field now of this profession of coaches. There are people who say, I want to be a life coach. I want to be a professional coach. And it's like, well, what's your specialty? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> what is what do you want to focus on? I don't know. What's really going on is that they want to be a part of a community. And so when you're able to manage your emotions, you're able to look at these situations with kindness and empathy instead of judgment. And then that puts you in a position to kindly say to people, yeah, man, this ain't for you. Because sometimes they need to hear that. Right. I mean, theoretically, th- theoretically, right? Um, I want to ask this question. I don't want to to make it seem suspicious, but um, <laughs> no, um, no. On a serious note, I feel like there's a lot of infiltration. I don't know how you feel about. There's a lot of infiltration of this once again community of coaches, um, people that really do not have our best interests in mind. If you get what I'm saying, I don't want to call them what I want to call them, but you know. Yeah, I f- I feel like. I feel like it's like that really across all industries. Um, even, even in, you know, even in music, people call themselves musicians. They're really not. Even in, even at hospitals, you know, some, some people got C's in college. It happens, right? Um, but the point is for me, that's, I go back to what I was saying before about no one's coming to save you. Because with the self-awareness, you can recognize, especially if you're in tune with yourself, your body, your life, then you can recognize that this just doesn't feel right. And then you can have the confidence in yourself to deny it without having a reason why. Because people will say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you like this? Why not this? Why not that? And you don't owe anybody an answer. It doesn't feel right for me. And so then if you're one of those people who feel like you're in an industry full of the frauds or whatever, but you're legit, you're sincere. 
you have to embrace the journey of overcoming that aspect of the profession, right? So where's your energy and attention going to go? It should not go towards battling them because they're going to see themselves out one way or another. Right. You focus on the helping. You mm -hmm. focus on elevating yourself. And in time, it's, it's, there's going to be alignment. In time, the right people will come to you. Because I know that there are people in life right now who say, and are sincere about needing an emotional intelligence coach. That doesn't mean I'm the right person for them. Mm -hmm. So we have to see how we align. And I can't sit there and think about who's faking it, who's fraud, who's this, who's that. I have to focus on me so that I am available with kindness and empathy and awareness for the people who I match with, who I can help. And every time that I help anyone, any client that I ever have, I learn from them as well. Like I'm, I'm never above learning. I'm never above being open to new lessons. Right. Your only competition should be self Yeah. I like that. I like that. I have really enjoyed all of your presentation. I love the interaction. I'm happy that you got exclusive to come off. Um, <laughs> come on, come on, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, honestly, Empress, I want to put it like this. I actually read the room and I kind of analyze the room before I say anything. Because ah, okay, okay. You're just getting to know us. Gotcha, okay. gotcha. Very nice to meet you. My name is Laurel Lamkin. Pleasure, pleasure. I'm the founder and CEO of WITSI, the Women's Institute for Trauma Survivors International. We had with us Mr. Charleston Gaines, a very intelligent, emotional intelligence coach. <laughs> <laughs> and he has been sharing with us all about how nobody's going to show up for us. I love that. I'm, I'm going to take that away. Nobody showed up to save you. <laughs> I'm going to be using that a lot. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I'll say, AKA Mr. Gates, check him out. He's going to tell you this a lot as well. So I feel like we've reached a natural conclusion to our time. And we do have the next two speakers here with us in the Zoom room as well. So in interest and presence of their time, I wanna say thank you so much for what you shared with us today. This is not the last time you will be asked to come associate with us. And I actually am going to be working on something um, starting this week. I'm gonna be traveling to explore that. And I already dropped your name as somebody who I knew would also be great for this initiative. Um, it does involve veterans. So that's why I felt like I may be able to collaborate with you on that project. All right. So you'll be hearing from me once I get more details after the trip. Okay. Well, right. Thank you very much. I, I so appreciate the opportunity to be here to serve you in this community. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. We have all enjoyed you being here. And if anybody else wants to come off mic and offer any last words and thank yous to um, Mr. Gaines, feel free to do so at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed listening to you and learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right. We're going to stop the recording here. <laughs>